Picture this. It's 6.44am and you're just starting to rouse. And then, as the clock ticks over to the designated hour, the music playing on the radio is... I'm walking on sunshine, wow, and don't it feel good? And then all of a sudden you're up, Woo! You're in the shower, you're washing your hair, and you're singing along, and you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, music is magic. I'm going to set my alarm clock to that song every single day. But let's just run that scene again, and this time with a couple of small changes. It's still 6.44 a.m., Joy. You're starting to rouse, but as the clock ticks over, this time the music playing on the radio is... Oh, sunshine when he's gone And he's always gone too long Anytime he goes away And all of a sudden you remember the relationship breakup that just happened and you become plagued with questions like, will I ever find love again? Will anybody ever love me again? Am I destined to be alone? And instead of being out and in the shower, you reach over and you turn off the alarm clock and you send a quick text to work saying that you're feeling very sick and you pull the cover back over your head as the song goes around and around. Wow, that's two very different morning experiences, isn't it? From two classic sunshine hits. <laughs> what does that tell us about the power of music and how it works? Well, most people assume it explains how music has an effect on us and makes us feel and do certain things. But actually, in my work as a music therapist and a researcher, I have seen the same music have very different effects on people. So if you're not going through a relationship breakup and ain't no sunshine when he's gone comes on, you might just go, oh, I remember that guy. Oh, that was beautiful. Or you might get caught up in the poignant melody and how stunning it is. And... Uh, no matter how good that drum beat from Katrina and the Waves is, it's not going to get you out of bed if you've just had like a major car accident or something like that. Music is definitely not magic. So what is it that's counterintuitive to our assumptions about how music works? It's not that music has the power to do something to you. It's you who has the power to use the almighty affordances of music in any way that you choose. And because you have the power and responsibility, you can do that to make yourself feel fabulous. You can use it to relax. You can use it to pump yourself up. You can use it to connect with people. But you can also use it to make yourself feel worse. And music has been used for some pretty dark purposes over time, like isolation and exclusion. Hitler is an excellent example of somebody who clearly understood how to use the power of music. He combined pomp and ceremony and marching together in time to promote group bonding, which is very effective for both between him and his troops, and he paired that with widespread community group singing of Nazi propaganda songs, building this enormous sense of community and of people who were in the in-group, which, as we know, he then manipulated and turned against those outside of the group, and those in the group were able to tolerate unthinkable cruelty and violence. It happens all the time today, online, in schools. If you think about what it feels like when you go to a concert and that invincible feeling when everybody is just bopping along to the music and singing and you feel connected and you transcend the moment and you're so combined with everybody around you and how that actually could be turned and manipulated in any moment so that those outside the group 
are excluded. The power of music can be used in any direction. So exclusion is one, and intensifying emotions is another. If we go back to that scene from the beginning, the relationship breakup scene, and fast forward a couple of days, you make it to work, you tolerate the day, and you're driving home, glad to have made it through. And then all of a sudden, somebody breaks suddenly in front of you, and somebody else cuts across in front of you, and you start to get frustrated. So you go into the supermarket, and the person at the checkout counter is unbelievably rude to you for no reason at all. So that by the time you get home, you're feeling extremely intense, and you choose not to put on Eno Sancha because you're not feeling sad. You're feeling mad. So the question is, what rage anthem will you go for?、Hmm? Tchaikovsky, very good. Lincoln Park could work. How about Nirvana? Oh no! Oh no! I've got no one.、Uh, how about Alanis Morissette? This will do it. Sublimate your rage through the music and out the other side, so that you feel better. But unfortunately, you don't feel better. You just feel more rage, and even more unfortunately, so do the neighbours who have heard it all before and who race down to your door the minute the volume goes through the roof and start knocking. But you don't hear them because you're screaming.、Oh. Fun fact. <laughs> The police receive more calls to intervene in violent situations between neighbours when music has been the trigger than you would expect. So the most common use I've seen of using music is for rumination. We all do it. It's very normal to use music to match our moods, and music has this incredible power to bear witness to the intensity of our darkest feelings, and we can listen to it over. And over, and we can listen to it over and over. You know, it can be the classic breakup song, or it could be your "Nobody Understands Me" song, or your rage song. It's perfectly normal to use music in that way as the sun goes down and the hours go by, and we truly believe and hope. And often it occurs that we get some sense of release through that opportunity to stay with our feelings in the moment. But because we're the ones who choose how to use music, it definitely does not always work that way. You can use music to make yourself feel better. But you can use music to stay intensely connected to dark feelings. So when I say that I'm a music therapist, what that means is that I use active music making and music listening with people who are currently living with the dark side. Perhaps it's due to illness or injury or a range of life circumstances. And my particular work, the people I like most to work with, are young adolescents. And they often are struggling with depression and other issues, and they really don't need any help connecting to their darkest feelings. They feel them inside. They feel them above them. They're surrounded by their darkest feelings. It's tough, but they do believe in the power of music, and they often rely on music to help them to feel better. They're some of the greatest users. But because they misunderstand the mechanism of how music works and that it relies on their own agency to use it in particular ways, the results of their music listening can sometimes be extremely bewildering to them, and as I often hear from people, to the caring adults who are watching over them. So I once worked with a young man who had been using drumming very successfully for a number of years to vent his feelings, his rage, and he was. Doing it in a way it doesn't hurt anybody. When you play the drums, you have to be pretty fit, but it doesn't hurt anybody. It was very successful strategy for him. But as the years went by, and as his psychosis worsened, he began to associate practice with building up towards cutting and self harm. And so something which had been really helpful for him changed 
and became extremely unhelpful. Same action, same intention, he really just wanted to feel better, but a very different outcome. So we worked together in music therapy to establish a connection with a healthy and musical identity, looking at different ways of using music in his life and establishing a sense of agency about doing that. And we gradually reintroduced drumming, and over time he was able to keep drumming again without triggering uh, the desire to self-harm. But it took time and it took commitment, as therapy usually does. There was another young woman that I worked with, and she classically liked to listen to music as a way of escaping from the very dysfunctional life circumstances that she found herself in. And so instead, she would focus on lyrics about love and hope and other things that we all like to think about. But as she escaped, she also disconnected from some pretty important life functions, like eating. And then she began to compare her own body unfavorably to the pop idols who she worshipped, even though she'd managed an astonishing and very unhealthy loss of weight during that period of time. So then we worked together using songwriting in that case to write a new narrative for her life that began by acknowledging the complexity and the darkness that she was living with at that time, but stepped gradually towards something more hopeful, again as a part of long-term treatment. So neither of these two young people were at the effect of music, making them feel worse. But both of them used music as a way of supporting their journey into the darkness. And in both cases, they used it very successfully, despite not intentionally meaning to do it that way. So the next time you're listening to music, it's still a great thing to do. It's a wonderful way to match your mood. But all I ask is that you notice whether or not your intentions are being actualized through your music use, because it doesn't happen by magic. So if you want to use music to feel better, great. Did it work? If it didn't work straight away and you're happy to wait a little bit and spend more time there, did it work eventually? And if you want to use music to make you feel worse, which we often do, then notice when you've had enough time there how you might use music to step away again. When I'm working with young people, we often kind of actualize that process by creating playlists together. So we start with songs that mirror and validate the intensity of their darkest feelings. And then we choose more songs from their favorite preferred repertoire. And we step them gradually away towards something that's more hopeful so that they have a pathway out of their dark feelings in case they get stuck there. I memorably worked with one young man who decided he would reprogram his favorite music use once he realized that he was using it in an unhealthy way and that actually his favorite songs had become associated with trauma in his life. And when he listened to the songs, he felt re-traumatized. So he decided what he would do is that when he was going out for a good time, he would play his favorite musics and have positive thoughts. And then if he had a good time, if it all worked out well and he had a good time, when he drove home again, he would play those songs again. And he effectively reprogrammed his own music use because he really wanted to keep listening to those songs. So I encourage you, when you're using music, to keep it up. It's a great accessible resource in our world, more freely available to us now than it has ever been. So it's a wonderful opportunity and a great time. But just to be conscious of the fact that you are the one who is responsible for how you use music, and that if you choose to use music to take yourself into the dark side, just remember to use it to bring you back again. Thank you.